This is TechZine Talks on Tour, the podcast about enterprise technology that brings you IT insights and analyses from events all around the globe. We cover everything, everywhere. Visit techzine.eu for more information. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. Uh, welcome to this new episode of um, uh, TechZine Talks on Tour. Uh, my name is Sander, and I'm at the uh, RSA conference in San Francisco. I'm here with Philippe Verloy, who is a field CTO EMEA for Rubric X. Welcome to the uh, to the show. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, y- you work for Rubric, so we're probably going to talk about data security. Yep. I, would, I would imagine. Um, but just l- let's let's start with a bit of a wider lens. What do you see in general happening? From in, in especially in the area of ransomware yeah. and, and the threats uh, around that. Yeah, so Rubrik, of course, is very much focused on that ransomware angle. So I think in general, if you look at data security, uh, there's more and more talk about resiliency now. Um, so I think if you look at security in general, it, it used to be focused quite a bit and still is on preventative capabilities. Uh, but because of you know regulatory pressure and just what's happening in the news, almost each and every day there's data exfiltration, there's ransomware news. So people want to talk about resilience more, like how do you bounce back quickly and 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 successfully. Yeah. So I think most data security vendors yeah. are sort of going to, in that to be clear. Exfiltration is something different than ransomware. I mean, because it's part, yeah. it's probably part of it, but not always. Yeah. Is yeah. There a, do you see a trend there towards exfiltration more than? Yeah, I think we we see a clear evolution. Um, like initial initial first wave of ransomware, let's say, sort of happened in 2017. Um, of course, we had this whole uh, Petya, not Petya, WannaCry type ransomware, and then mm-hmm. uh, it sort of uh, proliferated to, to enterprises um, as well. And that's mostly, I think, a result of uh, the uh, shadow broker leak, the NSA shadow broker leak in 2017. Uh, they had this nice tool called Eternal Blue. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's all in the open now, so malicious actors can use that tool. Uh, to infect companies, and that's sort of what kicked off that real big first initial wave, I think, of ransomware, which was purely focused on encryption or mostly focused on encryption. Yeah. Uh, of course, these you know malicious people they are after profit usually. Um, so the more shots they have at uh, holding somebody for ransom, the the more chance yeah. they have to, to yeah. get the ultimate payment. So yeah. exfiltration is sort of ransomware 2.0. That's that's how I think about it. Uh, so typically, they exfiltrate your data, then they encrypt your data, and then you have two shots to uh, to hold you for ransom. Uh, there's of course, you know, other techniques as well, like doing double encryption and so on. Uh, but we see that the amount of uh, exfiltration in a typical ransomware campaign uh, went from less than forty percent two years ago to now more than eighty yeah. percent. And it gives them an extra an extra angle as well, right? So they can always say, "We will, we will." release your data anyway yeah. afterwards because they've exfiltrated the data itself. Yeah, I yeah. mean, at the end of the day, you still have to trust somebody with bad intentions, right? So yeah. how you know uh, how much can you trust that they won't leak the data anyway if, yeah. if you have uh, paid them? And we see that happening as well. Uh, well, it's also maybe the, especially coming uh, as you, you, you work for Rubrik, uh, it's also, it could also be the, the result of being successful in, in having people back up their stuff better because... If it's b- back in the day when they when it was only encryption, you thought, oh, you keep it. I will I will just back up from from where I yeah. <laughs> yeah. from where my backups are. Yeah. But now that's obviously they have another tool to actually uh, hit you with, right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, but I think even initially when we um, saw people, you know, successfully, you know, backing up these these large enterprises and sort of trying to recover from from ransomware, typically what we still see in those ransomware attacks is that people will go after the backup repository first. Um, So if you don't have some, let's say, security capabilities, typically it's an immutable copy of the data somewhere, uh, then they will hit your backup uh, and recovery capabilities first because they they know that's what you're going to attempt to do. Um, But to your point, yeah, I think it does play a role where they now think, okay, maybe they have recovery capabilities, so what is our next best shot here is if we exfiltrate the data. And I think but it, could so, make a, but it can still make a big difference between paying or not paying, right? Because yeah. I, I seem to remember the two, the two big uh, casino chains being uh, attacked in what yeah. was it November or yep. s- yeah. s- something yeah. like that, and one of them actually had a good good recovery in place and they didn't pay, and the others 
apparently didn't have it have, have their systems in order yeah. and they they paid yeah right? that, yeah that, that's the difference yeah no absolutely absolutely we see the same thing now with uh, united health for example in, in the us uh, like uh, it's sort of slowly uh being publicized like what the actual impact was but also the amount of cost they generated by not having that capability of recovery yeah. so yeah. yeah so and 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 um it it it's a, it it it, g- it gave you or co- and, and companies like Rubrik obviously more of a cybersecurity angle into into the market, which is, I mean, do, do you consider yourself a security company or? Yeah, yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I I remember I, I saw, I think it was from your CEO downwards, right? Because he was actually actively calling himself, uh, calling yourself a, a, a cybersecurity company on LinkedIn, and you know all the posts uh, starting yeah. a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. It's um, it d- does that. Does that re- make sense for a company like Rubik to do this? Because the, s- the security co- the security uh, um, environment is already huge. Yeah. The industry. Yeah. Why do you want to be part part of that? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I see, I see where you're coming from. <laughs> uh, but I think our thesis is a little bit that uh, data security is sort of the future of cybersecurity. That's sort of our the idea on which we sort of built this new mm-hmm. platform uh, that we that we've created. I think if you look at what uh, attackers are typically after, it's the data, right? It's mm-hmm. the most valuable commodity that most organizations have uh, next to people, uh, I would say. But um, so if you don't have application availability and you don't have data, then your company is not operational. And these malicious malicious actors, they know that. So they're going after the data. Uh, so I think if you want to truly be a security company, you have to have that data security angle as well. Yeah. Uh, but it is part of a larger you know, def- defense in that strategy. You being a data, a data company by nature, or, by, or, or by, from the from your foundation, it's a logical step to for you to take up that baton, and not because I, you could also say, well, why don't the the normal big security players become data security uh, players as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I think the way that we architected the solution, sort of from day one uh, in 2014, is. Uh, we built an immutable file system, and the immutable file system is still the basis of a lot of our capabilities yeah. here. Um, and so, if you take that reverse angle and you say, like, why don't you know typical, let's say, perimeter security companies build a data security strategy? Is they don't own that data, yeah. Uh, so they yeah. yeah they can you know potentially see data flows and so on, yeah. but they don't have a copy of the data. And that's no, but, but, but to be clear, uh, data security is only part of your security stack, right? So, uh, you, I mean, you still need all the other stuff as well. It's not <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it, and, it, and, but it, and it plays a, but it, and it integrates with them as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that's the other important bit is that um, we're trying to build a platform and the core of the platform is that data analytics capability that we have on top of backed up data. Uh, and that's where we are adding on those security capabilities like threat hunting and so on, uh, yeah. ransomware detection, ransomware investigation. Um, but next to that, we also have security capabilities that don't require a copy of the of uh, of the data either. Like that can work at the level of data at rest as well. So yeah. that's I think yeah. why we can legitimately claim we are a security company. Yeah. Yeah. And and what about the uh, from your perspective? What about the the ways uh, attackers get into an environment? Right? Is that <coughs> I think identity plays a, a large role in that, from from my perspective at least. What, what what can you do against that? I mean, from a from a data security standpoint. Yeah, no, I I think I I definitely agree with that standpoint. Like identity is probably the number one attack factor uh, today. That's how people get in, especially in the cloud. Um, I think uh, I don't know who that stat came from. It might be Unit Forty Two of Palo Alto, but I think more than ninety percent of the initial intrusion vector is identity uh, in the cloud. Um, you know, you can find identity and account information almost anywhere these days. There's more than 12 million uh, accounts on GitHub that were publicly available, uh, like account information. Um, so there's yeah. there's things like uh, Redliner Stealer campaigns where you can just download a bunch of corporate identities uh, out of a Telegram channel or a Discord uh, inv- channel. So, um, so that's the easy way in for most attackers now. It used to be how can I breach the perimeter? How no. can I take advantage of a security misconfiguration or maybe even a zero day or something like that? Get into the system. Or even if you think about phishing somebody versus just trying to log in. If you phish somebody, they still need to you know, click on that link somehow, get a compromised device, and then you can get in maybe yeah. as an attacker. 
But if you have the credentials, you don't have to do anything. Yeah, you just logging log in. in is a new breaking in. Or yeah, whatever, logging really. is, is, a new, is a new breaking in. Yeah. And because it's a legitimate credential, your security tools won't trigger anything. They think it's oh. a well, they, they, legitimate they, they, There person. are some, some companies that are actually focusing on this Azure AD and, and Entra yeah. ID kind of yeah. environments. And they have a, I just had a chat with one of them and they, they have uh, 150 indicators of compromise to to even with normal logins. So they, there is some something is happening in in, in that in that in that space, but it's 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 very hard. Yeah, yeah. To, I think I think it. even from the data angle, you can uh, you can see a couple of things related to to identity uh, in terms of, for example, let's say uh, you capture a full backup of uh, Entra ID, and you do this on a regular basis, like each and every day. And you start comparing access of a specific user or a group one day to the next. Yeah. And you suddenly see a very weird change, an anomalous change. Somebody all of a sudden uh, in the engineering department got full admin rights on the entire environment. So things oh. like that could, could be an indication something is about to happen, let's say. Yeah. Uh, so you could definitely react to yeah. that. Uh, so that's also something we from a data angle yeah. can see. It's a very hard problem to fix. Yeah. I mean, because it, how do you de de determine... For, for for certain <laughs> that that something is wrong, it's just, it, it's extremely extremely hard to do. Yeah, I think even mm. just mapping out what the effective permissions are for a user today has become very difficult. Like we have Active Directory, that's that's true, but there's you know permissions and roles and stuff in the public cloud, and these things are mapped together. Right. Uh, so how do you understand assigned permissions versus effective permissions? That's already a, a serious. Yeah, and then issue. you get and then you get into the IAM I, 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 IAM space and the, and the privileged access and, and how they how these things uh, interact with yeah. each other. It it gets confusing quite quickly, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then uh, you, you mentioned earlier that you see more. It's more about resilience now. Um, on the one hand, I think that's a, a good a good uh, evolution, but it also it, it also comes across a little bit as let's just not bother too much with prevention anymore because we're uh, <laughs> I mean from a from 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 your standpoint where you are the last line of defense with all mm -hmm. your data uh, then I, I I get that but in general do you think that's a good evolution to not necessarily focus on on, on prevention that more that that, that that much anymore. Uh, if you agree with that, uh, yeah, view, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily put it that strong as as in don't focus on prevention anymore. Uh, I I still think defense in depth is the is the right strategy. So it needs to be prevention plus recovery to get to uh, cyber resilience. But if you look at how much money end users in general are spending on IT security, IT risk management, and implementation services, it's uh, it's over two hundred billion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And then if you see all of the you know, data breaches and ransomware attacks in the news, it's sort of not, like it's not matching up. So no. we're spending quite a lot of money on preventative measures and these things keep happening. So that's why yeah. so it that needs to become a combination. Yeah. That yeah. means if you spend so much money and, st and this still happens, it means it's not really working very well, the prevention. That's what yeah. you're saying. Or, or you could say um, without spending that 200 billion, uh, it might be even worse, right? So 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 hey, today we... Proving a negative is always yeah. very hard, right? Yeah. yeah, so today we see um, there's a, a ransomware uh, operation every 40 seconds and every 10 seconds it's successful. Hmm. Without those preventative measures, maybe it's successful like yeah, every two seconds. Yeah. That's yeah. Always, that's, it's always quite hard to... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, to do, but, but but there is a certain inevitability about this, right? Yeah, that you need to just accept. Maybe. Yeah, I think if you sort of assume breaches, sort of how people st are starting to look at it. So, uh, typically thinking it's not a matter of if; it's going to be a matter of when. And these days, it's not only a matter of when; it's how many times it will it will yeah. happen. Yeah, uh, it's a bit of a depressing thought. But yeah, 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 yeah. No, <laughs> that's 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 true. Uh, so I, I recently saw a stat from from Proofpoint, and they say ninety four percent of all uh, cloud uh, environments are are attacked on a, oh. on a weekly basis, That's and, a lot. and two thirds of them are successfully breached. So mm. it is happening, yeah. uh, sort of happening to to everybody. Yeah. But I think if you go into this assume breach mentality, it sort of can remove some mental roadblocks on how you think about security in general. Yeah. So it sort of extends your vision from focusing purely on the preventative side, but also incorporating the resilient side. Yeah. And if you know you have recovery capabilities, it sort of um, yeah, it, it sort of eases your mind a little bit in the sense that, okay, it, 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 if yeah. it happens and it probably will happen, yeah. we can bounce back, right? Yeah, but companies still need to find a sort of certain balance between one and the other, right? So yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
taking pu pu pulling all of the 200 billion a year on the preventative measures that's not probably not the solution then <laughs> as well right because as you correctly mentioned maybe it, it would have been even worse if if we didn't have all yeah, the prevention yeah, uh, yeah. going on so how do you do that as a, as a as a company or as an organization how do you determine the balance between resilience prevention and all the other kind of security related things uh, for your company yeah i think you look at this through the lens of risk uh, so you try to determine what is the actual risk and what is the attack surface that I have and, and what does the combination of that mean. So if you think about risk, typically the way I look at it is what is the likelihood that something will happen? And if it happens, what is the impact on my organization? Yeah. And then what can I cover off with preventative tools and what can't I cover with yeah. preventative tools and need uh, resilience for? Um, so so, so that and, and, and the effect of something like this, is: do you measure that in, in a monetary kind of value or in reputation or in i don't know any other <laughs> yeah yeah I, I think i think it can be a combination of of both and it and it typically is i think um so risk at a higher level in the organization is is not only determined by it risk of course there's other types of risk but so for example if you look at what are the chances that my uh, factory floor will burn down um and and what are the chances that a cyber attack will happen against my factory environment uh, and it turns out like it's five times more likely that a cyber tra yeah. cyber event will happen than than, than it burning yeah. down. But that's how they that's how you need to think through risk. Is so, so what can likely yeah. happen? That's what we're gonna invest yeah. and protect against. And then from a backup perspective, that that's that's obviously that that's why backups were we've initially invented, right? To say, well, what if a plane falls on my data center? I need to be able to to back up everything. And they, those are very unlikely <laughs> un unlikely things. So yeah. you need to have a complete shift in in in, in your head about how you think uh, about backing up your data and securing your data you know and all that stuff yeah it's yeah absolutely yeah 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 so so that's why you see things like people building you know resilient environments and that's why the cloud has uh, you know redundancy and high availability and all, all those things yeah. uh, but that backup copy is sort of like you pointed out before the last line of defense so if everything else fails and you have an immutable backup copy and you have the capability to recover quickly but also intelligently meaning what if there's still malware in that backup data that you have and you're going to just restore it back to a production server and reinfect your entire environment? Yeah. So those types of additional security capabilities you need to layer in, yeah. uh, but it's still the last line of defense. Yeah. And m m more generically, right? Because uh, I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of companies, one of the biggest risks is, is still being attacked by ransomware, whether that is because of for encryption purposes or for exfiltration purposes. That's a different that's a topic we already covered. How do um, how can you um, determine the risk for that, right? So um, I think they all think that they all know that they're they're, they're they're vulnerable, right? Yeah. But it's it's it's. It, it, I mean, what I'm trying to say is paying for 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 when for, for, um, uh, when you're attacked is always on the table for some companies. Mm -hmm. Do you think we need some sort of a uh, prohibition on 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 paying for ransom, uh, paying the ransom for the uh, and, uh, for and a ransomware attack? Um, yeah, it's it's kind of it's a sort of double-edged sword, of course, right? So if you pay, you signal to the to the malicious actor that you're yeah. open to paying, and you might become you know you you might become a victim again down the line because they know for you it's an option yeah. uh, to do that. So. Um, I I, th I think it exp you know it does more harm than than good. Uh, but if there's no other option, you can't just you know stop. Now, yeah, it's also be you have to be 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 realistic as well, right? Because I I once had a chat with someone. He said, well, for us, paying has always been an option. It, it, we kept it on the table because if we cannot accept um, uh, orders in our environment yeah. for m more than a week, yeah. we're basically done. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're bankrupt and we're going to go away. So, and that means 50 people don't have a job anymore. Yeah, right? exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, because there are some voices in the in 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 the world saying we should just ban all, uh, ban ban the payment of uh, of, of ransomware, yeah. uh, um, uh, uh, ransomware attacks. But that's not very realistic. Yeah, I, I w generally I, I would agree with that. Um, I think let's say you're a hospital and there's you know thousand people in in a thousand beds in your hospital and you get ransomware and and you're not allowed to pay a ransom and that's yeah. the only option you have to 
recover? What are you gonna do? Yeah. Uh, by then, it's a matter of little life and death. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, to some extent, it it should still be uh, it, it should still be possible. Yeah. Uh, but I I do agree that you know we need more um, regulatory scrutiny there to sort of figure out like is this really our last resort to pay ransom yeah. or should we force companies to come up with some sort of resilience plan? And uh, that, that, that brings me to my next uh, that, because that was actually the lead into the to the rules and regulations part of this uh, <laughs> of yeah. this issue. Obviously, we're going to get a lot of lot of stuff. In, in Europe, at least, we're going to get the NIST 2 and we're going to get DORA, and, and, and there are already other st- st- things in place, and probably a no, lot more coming because we love to make rules in, uh, in Brussels. <laughs> uh, uh, what, will that, what will that do for data security? Will, that, will it help, or will it, I mean, what, what's, your, what's your view on it? I think it's, it will help in, in a way that it allows security people to have a conversation with the grown-ups in the organization, meaning with like business leadership, um, because to some extent they're now being forced to take action. Um, there's you know potential fines associated with these regulations, uh, potentially serious fines associated with them. But we've seen in the past with things like GDPR that that's not always enough to force people to no. take appropriate <laughs> action. Um, but still, now I think it, it becomes part of that risk calculation. So if we are on the line for, let's say, $10 million, if it's DORA or NIS2, for example, or, you know, 2 to 5% of your, your yearly turnover, those are serious numbers for a large organization. So uh, they can take that into their risk calculation uh, and then figure out yeah. how, to, how to respond. So I do believe it, it can help. Yeah. Um, on the other side, we have to avoid it becoming like a, sort of checkbox operation where people say yeah compliance is never a yeah never, never a good solution no yeah. i'm just gonna do it because they want me to do it but in yeah. reality i've not really implemented it yeah. in, in a decent way my, my question is also how realistic is for example something like nis2 where where one of the in some of the articles you have the the reporting duty right so you on the one hand you have to tell people within 24 hours of, of detecting uh, a, a breach that you've been breached but you also have to have a, a full report available um, in within 72 hours, uh, and I, I, I'm not a, I don't know all the companies in the world, but I think um, over half of them will will just plainly be unable to do that. that so that th- this regulation will come with a lot of ex- extra investment to actually be able to just prove you you were breached yeah. and do the full reporting, right? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree with that. I think that's probably one of the bigger challenges is the the, the reporting duties that you have. Um, like I mentioned, United Health before, as, as an example, mm-hmm. they w- are still not able to report exactly on, on what was uh, impacted, oh. right? And it's it's weeks later uh, because it's extremely difficult. And typically, what happens is they bring in a third party uh, solution provider, uh, investigation uh, organization to help help them figure it out uh, what went wrong. Um, so, so that's another thing we have to sort of make part of the platform is build capabilities that make that really easy. Yeah. Because we now know regulation requires it, yeah. so an organization should build in their platform yeah. the capability to yeah. report on that. But that indirectly means that they're going to have to do some very heavy investing into their estate in general, right? Because they probably have to throw out lots of legacy stuff and replace it with something more modern and more more <laughs> more up to the task of actually getting all the data that you need to, to do the reporting. Yeah, and if you think about the changes in infrastructure are playing against organizations as well, right? So if you create the majority of your data on-premises, let's say, uh, there are probably tools available that can relatively easily help you uh, with those things. But what we see is that most data today is created either in the cloud or in SaaS applications. Uh, and typically, if it's cloud, it's multi-cloud. So how do you now understand what data was impacted after a breach if it's yeah. across all those environments? Um, so yeah, that's up to modern data security tooling yeah. uh, to help them. Yeah, I mean, it's, but it's, 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 I think also we're getting an example of, of a very ambitious uh, sort of rule or a regulation or a directive in, in this case, so NIST2 is a directive. Um, that, that if that's not entirely realistic for many companies at least not before 17th of october <laughs> no I, I, w- I would definitely uh, yeah. agree with that yeah yeah uh, so it, it first needs to be put into local law of course and then we'll see you know how watered down some of these things become yeah. uh, but i think the concept is 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 valid oh, yeah, uh, I, the, I do the reporting so too. concept yeah. is valid yeah. Uh, but yeah 
regulation and, and reality are typically two different things, right? And on the other hand, I think it came officially already. It came into force in the beginning of 2023, right? Yeah. So, but but then obviously the local regulation has to do with local law and all that stuff. So companies have had quite a quite a number of months and maybe even years to to do something about it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> you can't be surprised anymore. No, now. no, 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 no. That's that's true. That's true. Yeah. And sometimes you need uh, a forcing function, and and like running out of time could be a good forcing function for people. Yeah, to maybe, but but then maybe you won't have the the best implementation of, of uh, because yeah. you're 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 rushing into things. But yeah, but yeah, that's, diff could that's a different yeah, problem. Yeah, could happen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so we have one. We solve one problem with another problem. It is a maybe not 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 the best way of doing things. Um, yeah, and obviously um, we we we, can, we cannot have a dis discussion uh, in 2024 without talking about um, AI or Gen AI. Uh, what what what's what's the your uh, f f through your lens of data security? How does it how does it impact that from a both from a, an, an, an an attacker perspective and from a, a defensive kind of standpoint? Yeah, I think in general, if you look at um, security or cybersecurity, that's it's it's a big data problem typically, right? So you have a lot of systems, live systems, uh, that generate a, log a lot of logging information, for example. And if you can intelligently leverage some of that logging information uh, through AI capabilities or machine learning is maybe a better way to put it, uh, and sort of filter some of that signal out of that noise, I think there's a, an opportunity to build some interesting tooling mm -hmm. using that. Um, of course, just like with what we saw with cloud before, you had a lot of cloud washing going on, like all of a sudden, all solutions were cloud solutions. Uh, today, yeah. we're sort of seeing the same thing with AI and especially with generative AI. All yeah. of a sudden, everybody has a generative AI play and especially in cybersecurity, uh, it's, it's prevalent. So I, I always feel you have to sort of step back and understand what is the reality here yeah. and what does it mean for a specific uh, yeah. solution. But I think from a data security perspective, um, there's a lot of potential just because of all of the data and data growth that we're seeing. That's becoming a superhuman problem. You need some yeah. sort of automation there uh, to help filter out. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's something I hear a lot now and this week, uh, not only this week, but also, I mean, in the past months and, and years toward a sort of an automated AI kind of um, uh, automated security kind of um, kind, kind of approach. Uh, that's not something, again, that a lot of companies like because they see lots of things that can go wrong, especially in the more regulated sectors. They, yeah, yeah. they, they, they don't really want... Uh, I mean, and we, ha we haven't even be been able to solve the patching problem. So that's something that could uh, ideally be very easily tackled with automation. But... There you have lots of exceptions why you don't want to or you can't or you're not allowed or blah, 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 all the, all the, the, the patches. Yeah. So if, if we can't solve that one, how are we in, 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 in God's name going <laughs> to solve the bigger one with, with automated uh, cybersecurity? Yeah, no, no, I, 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 I would generally uh, agree with that statement. I, I think people still want a human in the loop. Uh, if you talk about things like automated remediation, for example, on the basis of AI, uh, a lot of people like the concept. But then they think through, okay, so I go home at 6 p.m. in the evening, I, I come back to the office at 9, and some AI tool made 10 configuration changes in my environment because yeah. it detected something. Uh, most people are uncomfortable with that yeah. scenario. So they still want to be they want to be informed by the AI, but they want to yeah. still make the decision themselves. So, some things you could actually just uh, immediately remediate. If, if in your previous example, when somebody... Uh, when, when somebody who's not allowed to create a, a, an admin account for something, that's something that uh, you could automatically say, hmm, we're not doing this. I mean, they, c they, can, they, can, they, can, they can create it, but it will never go into, uh, in, into force. You can, you could, yeah. I, I could see some automation controls around that. Yeah, I think, for example. I think s some of those capabilities where you're not potentially impacting the availability of an application for an end user, I think those can be automated, yeah. uh, automated away to a large extent. Uh, but yeah, it's it's more about making sure that when the factory starts humming in the morning, people can actually do their work. Uh, so that's that's where automation is maybe, you know, n not yet real or no. fully real today. No, no I don't banks, you know, you know yeah. they, they want to keep trading. They don't want to. They they don't they don't want to say, oh, well, you can't trade for an hour because we're installing a patch. Or uh, that's yeah, not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's not really a, that's not really a very good way to do it. All right, and then I think as a as sort of a final topic. Um, I, I've heard I've heard a lot about sort of DSPM, 
So, so the posture management, and then and not only DSPM, but there are lots of PMs in the in the world uh, nowadays. Mm -hmm. I, I would uh, I, ISPM, I think that's also one identity security. Yeah, SSPM, SSPM, CSPM. What, what's up? What's up with all that posture management? What's uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah, I think it goes back to understanding an attack surface, right? So what we hear a lot today is sort of uh, a drive to consolidate a lot of security tooling. Um, but the reality is like we're onboarding new environments, like we're onboarding cloud services, we're onboarding SaaS applications, uh, we're onboarding Charente AI applications to some extent, and, and those come with their own sort of attack surface and, and vulnerabilities. Um, so there's, there's always going to be some sort of imbalance or conflict, if you will, between the will to consolidate and the will to cover attack surfaces and, and newer attack surfaces. Um, so I, I think that's sort of what we're seeing. What we are trying to do is you build a data security platform and with, let's say, traditional rubric capabilities, you bring recovery to the table. And then where posture management comes in is that preventative angle a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So if we assume it will happen, yeah. what? how can we make sure that it's almost zero consequence? So if people want to exfiltrate data, Going back to your point about identity and how difficult it is to, mm -hmm. to, to secure identities. For example, what you can do to data security posture management is figure out which identities provide access to what data and in which manner. So does so then that you, then you're talking more about sort of sort of attack path kind of kind of kind of stuff. Yeah, it's exploit paths, maybe. Yeah, it's more like a data access governance to, to some extent where you can see, okay, if this person, let's assume this account uh, is part of a uh, of an account leak next month. If somebody would have access to, to those credentials, what could they expose mm -hmm. us as an organization to? Like, what data would would potentially be exposed? So you can say things like, okay, why does this person who works in HR have access to all engineering documents in the environment? And not only that, but they also have write permissions everywhere. So that's where you go back to the concept of least privilege. You sort of dial it down. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do from a posture perspective yeah. to sort of make the breach that might still ultimately happen less impactful yeah. uh, to okay. the organization. Uh, is it so but is, is it is a DSPM sort of a product that you need to buy or is it is it is it part of the platform and is it sort of a layer on top of it and is it just it's just on your screen but not necessarily a, a separate <laughs> product. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think for us and sort of what we're seeing in the market now uh, is is a drive to more platformization. Uh, so for us, it's it's you know a data security platform, and DSPM is a part of that. Um, and DSPM can also inform the rest of the platform. So that's why uh, we're so excited about making it a platform. So for example, what you can do is use DSPM to identify all data assets that you have across the cloud, multi-cloud, and SaaS, and then you have an understanding of how are those assets secured. Do no. they have a native backup assigned to in AWS or Azure or GCP, for example? Did somebody enable access logging on, on your buckets? Is there an encryption policy? So all of those things can be validated. But what we can then addi additionally do is, why not have that influence the protection scheme as well? So if we find, you know, let's say S3 buckets with a lot of sensitive data, why not automatically protect those yeah. um, and, and make sure they, they have a fallback scenario? Yeah, and then you don't have to go back to the early, earlier point you made of, of doing a sort of a daily diff of, of, of identity kind of uh, 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 changes in the, in the logs, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're, you, you're actually, because I take it that DSPM is, is, is continuously monitoring it. So it's, it's, it's sort of near real time. Um, you can see what, what, what changes and what happened. And, and you can also uh, uh, roll, roll them back or do something else with it. So it, it would it would make life a lot easier. You don't have to do so, sort of manually compare to daily outputs anymore, right? Yeah, and especially for the SPM, that's important because the idea is, okay, you might have a security incident, so somebody might have credentials and is able to log into your environment, but the whole goal of the DSPM tooling is to prevent that incident from becoming a breach. And you can't rely then on a daily diff, as you call it, because it has to happen in almost real time. Yeah. So what you're doing is you're monitoring server logs, you're monitoring things like CloudWatch in AWS. And with those real-time signals, you decide this doesn't feel like uh, correct operational use of my data. So I'm going to inform the SOC team or whoever needs to, to remediate, let's say, 
uh, so they can you know go go ahead and yeah. potentially block access for that user for example. And is a DSPM a, a, a big extra investment for uh, for for companies not only in in terms of monetary value but also maybe in training or sk upskilling people or how, how does that work? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't necessarily talk for other DSPM uh, no. vendors, but, no. but uh, um, one of the benefits, I think, of, of the way that we're building solutions these days is most things are becoming highly automated from a solutioning perspective itself. Uh, and that's also what you see with the DSPM tooling uh, out, of, out of rubric anyway, is that it's extremely low touch, uh, like the concept of, for example, needing to install agents on all of your data assets to do sensitive data discovery that's outdated so that's not something we want the cloud has apis the cloud has standard integrations yeah. so that's what we need to and that's what we want to leverage um so from a how do you operationalize it it's it's actually extremely easy and i think the other thing is we don't necessarily want to give you another user interface well that that's that's the, uh, that, that's my point right you yeah. don't want to complicate things even more yeah because who yeah. is the data security posture management engineer in the organization <laughs> Uh, so so the, 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 it's more about, oh, you already have ITSM tooling or you already have SOC processes. It's just taking that uh, additional intelligence about data security and feeding that into those existing systems so remediation can yeah. can happen using an existing uh, uh, process. So that way you harden it even more. That's the... Uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's a, a previously unknown attack surface that you're now sort of exposing and... and protecting which you know again looking at what's in the news each and every yeah. day it seems it seems to be yeah. very needed yeah. Yeah. do you think um with the, so, so if, if if we change the balance a little bit more between what we talked about b before between prevention and resilience and and if we do that right do you think we will see less of this of these breaches in the news or I mean, I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna keep you to your promises, but mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, you need to you need something to show for it, right? So, yeah. are you optimistic about the future in, in 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 that respect? Yeah, I think I think it's more about minimizing the impact or making it almost zero impact. So, incidents will happen, breaches will happen, data will get exfiltrated, but if we can make it so that it it's not your complete organization's PII information that got leaked. Um, so if we shield that important data in a much more, you know, capable manner than, than what we're doing before, the impact should be uh, should be lower. So I'm definitely optimistic about well, that a, type of approach. Yeah. So will it be in the news? It depends on how how important yeah. people, you know, find reporting on a data breach. If there's almost no consequence for, let's say, uh, let's maybe use an example. Like there was a data breach at 23andMe a while ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Potentially, 23andMe has you know genetical information of of people who sent in yeah. uh, those samples. So that's you know if we talk about PII information, it doesn't get more personal than, very than personal. that. I think. Yeah. Um, but let's say there's a data breach at 23andMe, and it's not the customer's PII information that got leaked, but it's a bunch of marketing documents or whatever. Does that get reported on in the news? Probably not, right? No, so, no. so and it's, so and, and it's not something you're going to pay for anyway. Yeah. So yeah. Then, then, then the because at the end of the day, you want we want the the business model for the attackers to go away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so as, lo as long as the business model is there, they're going to keep doing it, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, they're all uh, profit motivated. Uh, the, there was one. Um, um, it was uh, reported on, I think, by uh, UK's NCSC and, and and the NSA as well is that they sort of uh, sent out this note that they're seeing Russian hackers shift from, you know, on-prem to cloud and SaaS because that's where your gold is. Like, that's where you, you keep your crown jewels these yeah. these days. So so back to your point, if if there's no profit in them, in it for them anymore, they will probably shift no. tactics. But you can't prevent, you know, uh, you, no, you can't prevent an, a, no. an incident from happening. I mean, look at the MITRE uh, oh, yeah, issue true. a couple of, yeah. of days ago. Like, it's probably... You know, I, I don't know what's happening inside of MITRE, but from the outside, it looks to be like a very competent and very, you know, cyber yeah. capable organization. Yeah. But there's still going to be zero days in, in, in tools that you're using and, and people can exploit those. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's going to keep happening. Yeah. 
Okay, well, that may not be the most optimistic <laughs> ending, but in, the, in in general, the the ending was optimistic. So that's uh, that's that's nice. That's nice to hear. Okay, um, I think um, I think we're uh, we're out of time almost. Um, well, thank you for uh, for for joining us. Yeah, thanks for uh, having me. Until the next time. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Tech Scene Talks on Tour. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. That helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. If you'd like more information, please feel free to visit techzine.eu, where we cover everything, everywhere. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you'll join us again on the next episode of Tech Scene Talks on Tour.